uh, co-chair of the Arts, Culture, Education, and Street Life Committee. Uh, my co-chair, Alan Oster, is here. Hello, Alan. Hi, hi. hi, hi. Uh, in a moment, Alan and I will inter be introducing our speakers on the agenda. Before we begin this meeting, though, I'd like to mention just a few things. Just so that you're all aware, this meeting will be recorded and will be live streamed on YouTube for those that can't join in. Uh, you will be muted when the speaker is, uh, when the presenter is speaking. Uh, once we open it up to questions, I'll call upon you and you'll be unmuted. To be called upon, you can go to the bottom of your screen and click on participants. For those of you who don't, don't know, on the right hand side of your ski screen, you'll see participants listed at the bottom. And then there's a picture of blue hand, which you raise. You can click on raise your hand or lower your hand if you have a question. So um, there's also a chat function at the bottom of the screen. So if you click on that, a box will pop up on the lower right side where you can type in questions or comments. Um, please reserve your questions till the end of each presentation. Uh, I'll now do a roll call for attendance of our committee members. When I call upon you, just say present. You should all be unmuted. So Leslie. Present. Perfect. Judith Dayhill. I don't see her anywhere. Uh, Elzora. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing you can edit it to connect some dots. Okay, Wendy. You you. Myself. Oh, Blake. Don't record Wednesday. Here. Maria. I saw you here. somewhere. Present. Oh, here. Hollywood Squares. Uh, are you seeing these types of apps? Alan, you are here. I'm Rhonda. here. What is it? All right, so hi. Read that. It's like a television. No, Rhonda. David no, Pincus, you are here. Hello. Sabrina. Here. Sabrina, Hi. I saw you up in the corner. Kit Tullerson, see you too. Present. David Warren. I do not see David Warren. And I think that's it. Okay. Oh, I don't think I was called. Josephine is here. Uh, sorry, Josephine. No worries. So, so, jo so Josephine, you're in, you're a little bit in the middle of uh, you're not uh, really Twilight a member zone. yet, but <laughs> oh, I see, got it. You're not, got it's it. not official yet, so you're not on the list. Um, but you're here. Thank yes, you. I'm here. All right. So, as a as a as a full board member. <laughs> yes, as a full board member. Um, I think Alan. I think um, Alan's going to introduce our first uh, discussion, the status of the youth employment and summer school. And do we have Blake here and hopefully Alexander, but I'm not sure. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you. Did you, did you want to say, um, you want to do it? You want to oh, do it? I totally forgot. I was going to do that at the end, but I'll do it now. You're right. Yeah, not at the end. Everybody wants to go home at the end. Yes, everybody wants to go home at the end. I am going to resign from the board. Uh, unfortunately, oh. yeah, unfortunately, personal things have gotten a little too hectic right now. Hopefully, I will be back. I may stay on as a public member. We're still working that out. Um, but I will either way be very vocal, if not more vocal, <laughs> from the outside. So mm -hmm. I am going to resign. I will... This will be probably my last ACES co-chairing meeting, and uh, Alan and someone new will take it on from here. So I've I've worked I've I've been happy to work with all of you. It's been a great I think it's been five five years for me. I'm not sure, um, but it's time to do something else right now. All right, go ahead, Alan. Thanks. So you. Uh, before before we start, I just want to take a moment to thank thank you, Inga. It's been a pleasure. Uh, having you as a co-chair, and I'm sure everybody here uh, has appreciated um, all your efforts and work and and your vocalism in, in, in everywhere else. And um, we're hoping you can make you know, continue to make a contribution um, going forward. Uh, so lo looking at um, the screen, I see we have two illustrious members of uh, the council office. I don't know who... Uh, 
I think Carl um, has some um, obligations and I think he wants to make a presentation on what's happening in the community and then Eric or does Eric, uh, I don't know, uh, you guys want to flip a coin on this or? I'm going to let Carl. Um, okay. Tonight's Carl's night. I'm just here to watch. Just and I just want to say, um, Inga, um, I was so sad to hear about you leaving the board. I just want to say real quick um, that we um, love, love, love working with you. And it's a big loss for CB4, but I, I'm very happy we'll continue to work together at the Penance Association at London Terrace and in, in many other ways. So Definitely. thank you for your service. Thank you. Definitely. I may become more active in other ways. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, Carl. Carl, the floor is yours. Carl, our community liaison person from uh, the council's office. Thank you, Carl. Sure. Um, so thank you, Alan, and thank you, Eric, for your support as I give this presentation tonight. Um, it's actually a very short um, presentation. I think uh, Alan reached out to us to um, get, uh, uh, you know, a t our take on the um, on the mayor's proposed cuts to um, the uh, summer youth, uh, the, the summer youth program, uh, summer youth employment programs. Uh, the council is very concerned about uh, their there's a proposed 40% cuts to the entire agency, the Department of Youth um, and Community Development. Um, you know, we think this is, you know, we're very concerned about this and the council intends to fight as hard as they can to get some of that funding back. I think there are um, some operational uh, concerns about uh, how that program would uh, play out. But right now with the coronavirus epidemic, we're looking at a $7 billion hole in uh, this year's budget. So, um, you know, it's not impossible to do this program over the summer, but it also depends greatly on um, the infrastructure that's set up by the city uh, in terms of testing and PPE and things like that. Um, and also this hinges pretty heavily on a federal stimulus that we uh, will need. So, you know, uh, Corey's been saying, you know, if we don't get this funding, we're gonna have to make, uh, we're gonna be looking at some cuts that are really painful. Uh, cuts that we don't want to see, uh, but um, you know we're definitely uh, very very concerned about uh, the effect these cuts will have on this program in particular. And the council is going to intend to, uh, while negotiating with the mayor, try to figure out a way to bring some of that funding back. Um, but I think if this is something that the board would like to see brought back and has strong feelings about its effects on the community and the youth in our um, uh, in community district four, I think that it, it might be worth it to put that in writing uh, to the mayor. And I actually just got off of another conference call with Corey and he suggested to the parents um, at uh, the PS 11 that we were talking to that they, uh, and uh, this is another action I think the board may, uh, the committee may want to consider is uh, writing a letter to the congressional delegation, uh, thanking them for their uh, work and, uh, you know, outlining the need to push as hard as they can for the uh, federal stimulus. So, um, you know, we're, uh, we're, like I said, we're extremely concerned about this. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that in the summertime that our young people have all the you know, tools they need to be successful. We definitely have some challenges of how that will look like and, uh, you know, how that would work in our new normal environment right now. But um, we don't, uh, we want to, look at how we can uh, share some cuts across the board as opposed to uh, hitting one agency as heavy. And Eric, I know it's my night to pr present, but if there's anything that I forgot there that you wanna uh, throw in, uh, happy to uh, you know, cede the floor for a few minutes. Yeah, I think you hit the main points. With respect to youth funding and programming, we're particularly concerned about that because if you take away the yes. summer youth and twenty, if you take away the summer camp, if you take away all the the if you close the beaches, if you close all the things that young people occupy themselves with, what are they what are young people gonna do? They're not gonna sit at home all day in the summer. And a lot of um uh, you know, the issues we work on res with respect to public safety involve young people uh, 
we're also talking about young people who are have already looked, fallen behind academically because of what's been what's what's happened with the remote learning. So the, what the council is really trying to do is encourage the administration to think a lot more creatively than they are. What kind of youth employment could you do in a safe, socially distant way? Could youth be part of help support in some way the contact tracing efforts that are going on. We're going to be hiring thousands and thousands of contact tracers. So maybe they're not the contract tracers themselves, or maybe they could support those teams in, in some ways. What could the young people do to be part of this effort? How do we tap the cultural institutions of our city to um, create some kind of programming that could be done in a socially distant way. So that this is all a conversation that's going to be going on in the weeks to come as the council negotiates the budget with the de Blasio administration. I think one of the um, keys will be really challenging the administration to find cuts that don't um, that aren't made on the backs of um, the young people, both in and out of the classroom. Uh, thank you, Eric. Carl. Anything to add? Um, no, I think I think that about covers it. Um, we're happy right. to answer questions if you all have them. Um, you know, we're still in a uh, an early, a beginning phase of this whole negotiation. So uh, there, as you know, more developments come, we're happy to come mm -hmm. back. You know, I try to come to all of these, so we're happy to keep you all informed as those uh, talks go on as well. Okay. Uh, let, let me just throw something out. Not so much of a question, just maybe a comment somehow, or maybe something you can follow up on. At our last meeting. Um, we had some folks from DOE, however, I don't think it was their purview in terms of their obligations to answer. But we did ask about some school, and we did ask uh, specifically perhaps um, maybe on a limited service to some of our underserved uh, students uh, that may not have made it through this remote um, session uh, as well as some other uh, students have. So. The question just is, is there somewhere perhaps you can push on this issue a little bit, see what can be set up in some way, um, and just maybe give us some heads up on it if, if you make any headway on it. And, huh? <laughs> yeah, with respect to summer school or any kind of school, if we're talking about in-person instruction, um, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah, based on everything I've heard, um, the um, the the um, Michael Mulgrew of the UFT recently put out a list of things that you know the teachers feel will be necessary before the young people can go back to school, and that is um, universal PPE. Um, testing, universal testing, temperature uh, checks, um, uh, and many other things that we just don't have at this point. So um, that having been said, it's May 11th, and perhaps between now and the end of the academic year in late June, there'll be some kind of um, creative um, things being discussed regarding summer school, but I have not heard um, about in-person summer school yet. No, no, I, I, was, I was leaning more towards the continuation of the uh, online, um, on the online service, you know, basically, so. All right, no, but whatever, whatever you can, you can figure out for us it would be great. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it, I'll turn the, you know, over to whoever has questions. Inga, you want to? Yeah, I have one question, actually two questions, so I'll say it right up. <clears throat> Carl, the letter writing to the con congressional delegation, who were the other, was the first letter you said they were writing, who, who should we write a letter to? I think, um, I think to the mayor's office would mayor's be office. appropriate. Yeah, we could, to... So we could write one letter to both. Okay. Um, and then my other question was, um, just to throw it out there, it's not really a question, is when I was talking to the Avenue School, we discussed um, tutoring 
I've been talking with some other people about high school students, especially helping um, graduating seniors, especially from the private schools, helping the public schools, because they're a little bit ahead of them in terms of what they're doing after they graduate. And we also thought about tutoring for younger kids. Some of the high school kids would want to volunteer and possibly tutor some of the younger kids over the summer for extra credit. Um, so I don't know, that's just an idea I'm putting out there. I think a lot of schools would be happy to help with that, especially our private schools. Those kids are in a better position to help tutor the younger students. And that could be part of a, a program that they get credit for helping public school kids that need some kind of structure. So that's all. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I think we're gonna have to really think creatively like that about, mm -hmm. um, you know, how, you know, we, we cope with this uh, new learning normal for kids. It's an, and it's an interesting idea. Okay. Even retired teachers are willing to come back and do some tutoring. So I've talked to some up here just on the internet. Um, so that might be another option. Some retired teachers want to help in some way and they would be willing to tutor kids for free. So I don't know. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, we have a, uh, a question from David. Mm -hmm. Dave. Unmute yourself, David. Um, Alan and Inga, I just wanted to remind you that we have Alex Bencourt from DYCD here. Right. Okay. Well. Which is, so I didn't know if you looked okay. before we oh, got into I didn't into, see him. Yes. Yes. So if you would, would okay. I think maybe it'd be right. good to have let him. Okay. Know. Let's hold off on the questions and we'll go to uh, Alex. Okay, Alex from um, uh, Youth Services. I don't know if he's on, is he on the phone or? He's on the phone, yeah. He's, on, he's still muted. Is he on the phone, Jesse? Is it star six? Does he have to be? I'm not sure if he's he needs to be on mute. Alex is unmuted now. He was unmuted. Okay, Alex, you're... I think he might have had bandwidth issues there. That's great. <laughs> I heard him and then he was gone. Um, all right, we'll go back to questions mm. and then he'll come back. I think he had bandwidth issues. So David, you're back up. Okay. David. Hey guys, how are you? So uh, just kind of, Inga, you were reading my mind. Um, you know, I have a, a five-year-old and uh, we're doing this remote learning uh, extravaganza. And it's, it's, it's uh, one is the teachers are wonderful, but there's not enough of them. But the experience is, is that we're having two 15 minute sessions a week where it's one-on-one -on -one in a small group with, um, with our teacher and our teacher's fantastic. And we have little private tutor, you know, we have private, calls in with her but the idea of increasing the, the burden is all on basically me and my wife and mostly me and mm -hmm. it's extraordinarily difficult to have a, you know your child listen to you and to and and, 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 and an, an adult face or a senior or an older student to have any sort of tutoring time that was regular would be an incredible boon to her educational mm -hmm. experience which is progressively every day kind of getting worse and worse yeah um so I, I second your emotions. Okay. okay. Um, how's Alex doing? Is Alex um, available? I don't see him back yet. No, he's on the screen. Oh, he's back. He's just okay. uh, uh, muted still. Alex, are you yeah. able to unmute yourself? Hello. Yay. Oh, gotcha. Okay, Alex. Thank you. Go. <laughs> Good evening, Welcome. everybody. How are you? Good evening. Thank Good. you for coming. My pleasure. Uh, I think that the young man from the speaker's office basically laid out what the entire scenario looks like for DYCD right now. Mm -hmm. And the type of conversations and discussions that are taking place between all branches of government regarding any potential, you know, resolution to the issues. We have commenced operationalizing the cuts that we were directed to take um, with a heavy heart. 
nonetheless, you know, we, we are hopeful that we can get through this summer and continue working with our young people the way we have over the course of the last 10 years as it relates to, you know, quality summer, quality youth engagement activities across the city. I believe that I've shared a document with all of you, um, specifically with, um, with your, your DM regarding the, the kinds of conversations that we know are taking place. We know that there is a strong movement by the advocate community to make the case to the mayor and, and to the executive leadership. We also know that much of this is gonna be dependent on stimulus funding. Uh, you know, the kind of funding that comes forth from DC and then the way that that stimulus funding is distributed across the city and to agencies. We understand that there are many, many priorities related to public safety and that there are many priorities related to the overall economy of New York that affect the quality of service that all organizations in the city are going to be faced with in terms of good quality service delivery. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Alex, so let me, quick question, Alex. Um, obviously there's, there's a financial situation in here. Right. Um, are, there, are there portions of the program that if you do get a few bucks back in, that uh, could be put back on the program that would not um, um, put the kids into any um, hazard, safety hazard situation? Are there things that they could do online? Are there things that they can do that doesn't put them in a situation um, that they're going from that social distancing and, you know, um, are, there I, I, are there portions of are there portions of the program that can be brought back um, if the money, if some of the money com comes back to you? I mean, your program basically had two primary components. Your program had a classroom instruction component, and then it had your actual employer experience component. So I think that um, there are some conversations taking place that I know of regarding, you know, facets of the program that might be um, that they might have greater capacity to operationalize with less risk. Again, I don't have any particulars or any specifics, but I do know that that is the nature of the discussion with the advocate community and specifically the borough president's office, borough president Brewer, and the many organizations that she has been meeting with. Okay, so there's still a possibility I think, that, I think that it's all part of the budget negotiation process that mm -hmm. won't get resolved mm -hmm. until June, the middle of June, perhaps. And mm -hmm. that's going to involve negotiations and uh, conversations with the administration and the leadership of, of the city mm -hmm. council. Yeah, that's understandable. Okay. Um, Maria, you, had a, you have a question? from before or for, for Alex? Well, I'm not sure. Well, I was gonna ask Eric or Carl, but um, I don't know, maybe Alex can answer it, but I have three things on my mind thinking about the SYEP program. Right. Um, I was wondering uh, about demographics, particularly, because um, I can't remember how old the youth are. I'm wondering about ethnicity. 14 to 24. About, 14 to 24. 14 to 24 with um, a primary focus on, I would say, about 80 to 85 percent of the young people that are served in SYEP are young people of color, yeah. um, specifically okay. in targeted neighborhoods across Manhattan and across the rest of the city. I think you have a good source of information within the DYCD website. If you were to go there, you'd see a progress report uh, 2019 on summer youth employment okay. that may give you more of those particulars with greater specificity. Okay, that's good. So, 
to know. Um, can you just remind me also, maybe someone said it, how many um, youth does the program, and I, it may have been in the letter that I read, but I don't recall right now, um, how many youth the program employs in the summer? 75,000. And then my other question. And that has, been, that has been increasing incrementally over the course of the last five years because of the support from the council and support, additional support from the administration. The program was expanded. Okay. Um, and my other question is, I heard um, it brought up a couple of times about the stimulus funding. In the, right. But in, in stimulus funding, is there something going to be, would there be something earmarked that's for youth employment? Is that how it works? or? That I'm not sure. I'm not sure oh. of the details behind that, no. I and couldn't speak other, to that. Okay. And then my other thought, is it 7? It's 7 p.m. Um, yay! Okay, my, my other thought is that, so Community Board 4, we did a needs assessment recently, and one of the uh, greatest needs that we saw in our community is actually employing um, youth. It, it looks like right. in this community district that we have a higher rate of youth unemployment um, across the city. That's what it sounded like in the report. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there, and uh, I think keeping that in mind, and I think we need to do something. Whether we write a letter of support, whether we add our name to that letter, that was. Well, let me box. just let me just ask you um, when when um when your board went through the priority setting process, did you identify youth employment as the primary need? No, we didn't. But we also didn't know that that was one of the needs. Um, in our community. That's why we did a community needs assessment. It'll help guide us with right. making our budget priorities. So you're going to feed forward. the results of that needs assessment into the new budget priorities now? Yeah. You know, we'll have a discussion okay. and a debate about where, where it falls, but yes. All right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure of that. Uh, just to follow up with Maria on that um, report. Uh, the unemployment rate, according to the report, the unemployment rate for teenagers 16 to 19, 59%, second highest um, in the city, over the uh, citywide rate of 29%. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Alan. So I remembered it was higher. So. Okay. We'll be doing something. All right. Um, Kate, you have a question, please, or a comment. Uh, yeah, thanks. I have one question for Alex and then a question for Eric and Carl. Um, Alex, thanks for uh, the commentary. Very helpful to hear. Uh, I am one of the folks who every Thursday is pretty alarmed and pretty stunned by the jobs reports. Um, and I think you all probably know about 30 million people have lost their jobs and that number is likely only going to continue to go up. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And when, when you really think about it, you know, 75,000 young people that we serve and it's 150,000 applicants. And so as it is, we're only meeting you know, Other folks have had their hours people. reduced. I guess my question for you is it's in two parts. Um, right. What is the demand for our summer interns? Um, do, we, do we have a sense of that? Given how much we had, jobs we had a, are we had a very strong, right now, we had and a, the second part of the question, if I could just get all the way through it, is the governor has released um, sort of the phases in which different industries will reopen, uh, and it's broken out into four mm -hmm. phases, I believe. How are uh, what's the current thinking on how what will be reopening when might impact the sorts of job opportunities that young folks might get to the extent they're able to protect the uh, the numbers in this program. I have no way of knowing how far the industry assessments went in this process. We normally do an industry assessment every new program year. Um, many of our young people were placed in retail positions or in nonprofits. And I, I'm not sure if anyone has taken the time to really look at the new data and the new the new indicators that are going to surface as a result of the the pandemic to make some judgments about where opportunities are going to be
Appreciate the candor. Um, and I hope that we can protect the money for this program. Uh, it does seem like if we're able to get the revenue to continue it, which I'm obviously rooting for, um, it, it would be helpful to prioritize figuring out what are the, the new and different opportunities in line with some of what Eric was saying that, that might make sense at this point since retail is right. clobbered. Uh, nonprofits, I work for one, are almost all on hiring freezes. Yeah, I know. And those were uh, those were the two primary sources of of youth placements that we would do. So then, my, my other question for for Eric and Carl, and don't know which one of you uh, makes sense to ask this, is uh, countries around the world are are starting to open up their schools based on how they've contained and mitigated the the virus's spread. Um, one of the big changes that some countries that have started to reopen are having to make is facilities, things like adding uh, access to more places to wash your hands, things like upgrading ventilation. Uh, these are changes that are substantial and extremely costly uh, and take a lot of time to implement. If schools in the city are going to reopen in the fall, it seems like uh, they're potentially needs to be quick and substantial action on <coughs> addressing how DOE facilities could safely bring kids back into classrooms and, and through their doors. So just was wondering how is the speaker currently thinking about the facilities piece in terms of its level of priority and how we get the funding we need to have a, a chance of reopening school in the fall. So I don't know, um, I have not heard his thoughts specifically on uh, facil on uh, you know, adapting facilities. Um, I think that we still have uh, a lot of, I think we're gonna need to take, we need urgent action on a lot of aspects in order to bring kids back into September that we just, uh, at this point, you know, don't have the answer don't have the answer to but I think and Eric can correct me if I'm wrong here that um, any uh, when we were talking about funding it's really a question mark right now because we you know it, it really is going to depend on whether that money comes in from Washington or not um, and uh, with over the next six weeks or so I think we'll start to have some more specifics on uh, how that something might like that might work how would we open things up in a way that's safe um, but at the moment I don't I don't really think that we we know how that will will work is that Eric anything you want to yeah I think that's right I think uh, the facilities piece is something that should be discussed whenever we talk about what steps are going to be needed to reopen schools when we talk about things like PPE and testing the facilities piece is also something that should be discussed we were on a, a zoom call earlier with the speaker and the uh, parents of, of 75 more in middle school down the village and someone had asked about the drinking fountains at 75 Morton. Um, uh, how, how are drinking fountains going to work? Do they get changed to like pedal operated? You know, these are all things that are going to have to be thought out. And, you know, I think to um, your point, changes to facilities that takes time so that's that's kind of stuff that would have to happen sooner than later because as we all know it takes time to do things uh, um, in school so it's a part of as I understand it it's part of the the big conversation that that's happening right now mm -hmm. and just to add also I mean we um, you know the uh, the council does not have legislative authority over the Department of Education, but um, we, uh, Cor Corey has done probably six uh, uh, town halls with all of our school communities, and I think we're trying to hit all of them, all of our elementary schools at least in the district. And you know that kind of feedback and raising questions like that are have been really helpful uh, for Corey to take and bring back, so we know what to advocate for and to and to push for. Um, so certainly appreciate the comments and, um, you know, calling attention to that facility need and that's something we'll bring back to. Have, Carl, have we, um, have you done anything with CB4 schools so far? Because we'd love to do a forum if you haven't with our principals to see, you know, all the schools are so different. There's so many nuances with every school. Every school building is different. Um, like Eric just said, something like water fountains. Um, mm -hmm. But just so we can know 
how the principals feel, how the teachers feel about staggering school times or days or just so it just feels like they're not um i'm not i don't know if they're at the table or not but um like the head of the uft is saying that you know he's that he has he's not really seeing a task force by the mayor yet of how this is going to happen and we're just a few months off so i'm wondering have, have you guys spoken to see before is that that's something that we can help you with our schools here so we've done um, town, uh, what we're calling them town halls, but you know, a, sort of a Q&A sessions with the school communities of uh, PS 11, 33, 51, 111, um, 41, and 75 Morton. Um, so, and, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, and 212, yeah, and PS 212. Um, so we have, uh, you know, had, a, had forums where we've, where parents have been, you know, very candid with us about their concerns, and you know that uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, career school professionals who are weighing in was that came up actually quite a bit today at at, at one of our calls. You know, I think um, it's something that uh, we would like to see, uh, you know, more principals and uh, educational professionals weighing in on that. But you know, the ma the mayor has to um, choose who he chooses for his uh, task force. Uh, but we are getting a lot of uh, we are getting a lot of great feedback from teachers and principals in these forums and I, you know, those conversations will continue to be ongoing. Okay. Just to jump back in really quickly, um, really appreciate everything that you two are doing, Eric and Carl, and that the speaker is doing. Um, I just wanted to raise the facilities issue because of how long it takes to make facilities changes in schools. Um, also want to say really agree with, with Josephine's push on incorporating as much input from teachers and principals um, as, as possible. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say, uh, just to pass the mic to somebody else is, um, it feels like we have not yet, um, I think potentially as Josephine's point, um, been as candid um, as we need to be about what the challenges are with reopening school um, in the fall. I think a lot of people are operating under the assumption that school is going to open and it's very much a question mark. Mm -hmm. um, and if there was more knowledge of how many um, operational and instructional barriers there are to opening successfully based on all the different scenarios and the scenarios within the scenarios, um, perhaps we could create more urgency around advocating for the money we need uh, to get the job done. And so one idea um, that's not a solution or anywhere close to it, but could be one small piece of the puzzle is uh, the mayor already uh, and the chancellor had already announced the Imagine Reimagine Schools Initiative, um, which is focused on designing uh, schools for the future. Um, but perhaps smarter people than me are already talking about this, but my wondering has been, why hasn't that initiative been refocused on figuring out um, what schools should look like in the most likely scenario, which is that they continue to be uh, partly virtual with some kids some of the time able to go back to buildings uh, since we already have a huge amount of philanthropic dollars, um, a huge number of people dedicated answering the question, what should schools look like in the future? Um, and they're currently designing for a scenario that no longer exists. Sabrina has a question. Yes, hi, I wasn't here at last meeting, so I honestly don't know where are we at on this, but my question is in regards of access and technology. Um, I am just wondering how many of these kids have been completely um, equipped with um, one, the, the, the computer or the iPad and the Wi-Fi in our district. As far as I know, that issue's been resolved. I mean, I, I'm not hearing, unless um, Eric's office has been hearing about any issues of kids not being connected at this point. I think that they have done um, a decent job, at least in this district, in terms of rollout of kids who need um, extra support, um, iPads and Wi-Fi. Yeah. And I mean, there, there are some one-offs that, uh, you know, we've 
worked with the school and DOE to troubleshoot uh, where needed. But I think Josephine's right. I, uh, you know, I think as far as our school district goes, uh, you know, the kids have been able to get the, you know, the iPads and the, what they need to do the, the home learning uh, with some exceptions, but uh, everything that's come to us, we've been able to resolve uh, with DOE and, and working with the school. I'm looking at um, an article that I just found that, and this was on May 5th, it said that um, 300,000 internet enabled iPads are being lent to families and 255,000 have already been given. So I, I don't think that they're finished giving them to each uh, child, uh, which is really, really um, is, is, is uh, a terrible thing because we have in New York City, you have many young people who um, are going weeks and weeks without a remote learning device and they're falling behind. And then we have instances of people get, be, being given remote learning devices that aren't, um, they, don't, they don't have internet connectivity. Uh, young people who have um, connectivity issues in their homes, but they're, the, the first batch of iPads from what I understand didn't have cellular capabilities. It required a, a Wi-Fi connectivity. And so they had to, in, they had to take those back and then, and then give out iPads with cellular capabilities because if teachers trying to get their remote learning classes up and going with a few days notice, and many kids in the class, they weren't even able to, to get connected. So we locally have spent a lot of time trying to make sure that all our local schools have um, been able to give remote learning devices to, to young people. And as far as I know, we're on a local level, we're okay. But um, it's something that the DOE is, uh, I believe, Still, it's a job that they're working to complete citywide. Uh, Leslie, did you have a question? Yeah, it was for actually both um, Eric and Carl. Uh, so I'm gonna go on the other side of the spectrum as far as contingency plans. Um, and if they can't go into the brick and mortars in September, or maybe there's a second wave coming in next, uh, that's anticipated next um, winter, uh, the one thing, and Josephine, you can probably speak on this as well, and I'll piggyback what David said. Um, the one thing talking to, to a bunch of parents in our district is that distance learning, it, 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 it varies wildly depending not just on the school, but on the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can have a teacher in one grade uh, that is connecting with their kids and giving them worksheets every day, and you can have the teacher right next to her in the hall at maybe once a week um, they're connecting. Uh, and I understand it's a learning process. These teachers weren't equipped for this to begin with, but now looking down the road and, and Kit uh, gave the opposite scenario, but I wanna say if, say if there's not um, brick and mortar in September or in winter, is, is there gonna be a universal distance learning plan or are they working on that now that we do have the time to look forward because I think it's it is <laughs> I, I laugh because I am with David the, the distance learning is 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 such a I don't want to say disastrous because I, I understand the situation but it is it, it is unbelievable um, how it varies from teacher to teacher school to school mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if uh, the speaker had any long-term or they're looking at that long-term just in case. Eric, do you know, do you know about that specific? The honest answer is I don't, I don't know the DOE's long-term remote learning strategy, um, but that's something that we could um, ask for more information about. It's a controversial topic because on the state level, you had the governor mm -hmm. announcing that he was going to bring in the Gates 
Bill Gates Foundation and they wanted to reimagine uh, education and, and the governor even openly questioned the need to have brick and mortar schools anymore. And that was very upsetting to a lot of us uh, because for obvious reasons. That having been said, to your point, um, who's thinking ahead to the possibility that remote learning will have to continue beyond the fall? And it may need to be a combination of both, yeah. which is yes. what I imagine to keep social distancing, uh, you know, kids go to school alternate days that they go to school or, you know, they go to school for half days. And so the remote learning at some, to some degree will probably continue. So I think that you're right, Leslie, we should hear more about what are the long-term plans because it does vary from school to school and depending on the age of your child too is just wildly different if your kids in yeah. elementary school versus middle mm -hmm. and high school very different uh, experiences jesse go ahead jesse i just want i this is a very important conversation to have i just wanted to circle back to the agenda item which was the summer youth employment concept. And I wanted to give, mm -hmm. make sure if we had any other issues or questions for Alex or Eric or Carl on this, just to David, round out that. David, was your was hand that? raised from before or are you all set? You're on mute, you're on mute. You're on mute. Right, I, that's my hand was raised from before. Didn't put it down. Do you have any? I, mean, I can't. I'm trying to take it down, and it's not. Oh no! Nope. There you go. All right. Yeah. Bye, everybody. I have to go to another Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Here. Um, I just wanted to ask Hi, a Eric. ask a quick question because I read something online recently that um, this regard the a, a private school, religious school, was doing like four, four and a half hours worth of school time, as opposed to I don't know what is happening really in the public schools, but I get things from anywhere from a half hour of uh, teacher time to an hour or so. Uh -huh. So, yes, uh, I'm just curious if, if that's the if that's really a reality situation with the, with the public school. It's up to the parents. It's, if, if the parents will give a full day of instruction, that's they'll get a full day of instruction. If the parents want to leave to turn the TV on, then they'll watch TV all day. No, so so what I'm saying is teacher time. Yeah, teacher, yes. So the, so the religious school is, the kids are getting like four hours worth of teacher time. Yeah, That's I can say for a fact, no. my daughter, yes, we, it, it, there's live okay. classes. So um, from on at nine, on at 10, on mm -hmm. at 11, 12, 30, one, live, mm -hmm. live. Um, and th there's no reason, I mean, I don't think that the the, the public school system, again, I, I don't know the, the specifics. Carl might be able to speak better with the teachers union and how that works. Um, but it, physically okay. and um, logistically, it can be done. Okay. No, I, I just uh, so uh, make sorry. sure. Fred, Fred Maria. Alan, I just wanted to ask, what are we going to do about the first item on the agenda? Um, well, um, if, we, if we finish with that, um, about the youth, uh, uh, again, with suggestions yeah. made, you know, I mean, the only thing you can really do at this point is write some letters. Yeah. Uh, get, get, try to get some answers. Um, as Alex mentioned, things aren't going to really, they're not going to form anything up uh, until the budget is really um, um, solidified. So it'll depend um, what's going to get cut, what's not going to get cut. Can we maybe cut something and take that money and put it somewhere else where, uh, where you know, we can prioritize it in some way? I definitely think we should vote on a letter. And if, if Carl would be generous enough to get us a copy of the other letters that he's seen, that would help us in our letter writing. I have not seen, seen them? a letter. Okay. No, I, I, I we'll have, to, no, we'll have to make up our own. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, Inga and Al, I can get. C7 yeah. letter or that would be great because then okay. we have something so that we're consistent and maybe we can improve upon it or not but i think we should send a letter to the mayor and as carl said to the uh, congressional delegation i think one letter is fine and we send it to we cc everyone um i don't i think we should take oh. a vote but that's alan what do you think well we, we may have to tell you a little bit so i just want to ask the, the the committee first are there any issues 
um, that you want to see implanted into this? Uh, go ahead, to Kid. Yeah, I want to see the language of the, the letter that we're going to modify, but if it's not already in there, I would want us to encourage, um, I don't know if it's an assessment or a survey or a landscape analysis, but some sort of work to understand what would these employment opportunities uh, most likely be? Because um, they potentially mm -hmm. need to be shifted away from the most struggling industries in the city uh, to places that are more likely to have employment opportunities mm -hmm. um, if this is going to be successful. And mm -hmm. then also to integrate um, the phases of reopening and the governor's plan um, into the planning process as well, um, because we should probably be targeting uh, for our young folks, the uh, industries that are going to reopen the most quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not super well versed in the plan, um, but there's sort of a couple that open each phase. Um, and so if we're not taking into account, A, what are the jobs actually going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, B, what are the ones that are going to be uh, in industries that are getting closer to back to normal? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're not going to accomplish as much as we might. Okay. Alex, do you have anything to say to that? Alex is having coffee. <laughs> I'm here. Okay, good. I'm here. I'm listening. With the phases, do you have any, any input? Any, I was any having input? coffee while I was listening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> any input for our letter? Things that you think, you know, based on what Kit just said? Let's have me that coffee, sorry. <laughs> Uh, martini time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm telling I... you, yeah, it sounds good, okay? <laughs> all right. So uh, any, I letter? think there's one issue that you yeah. have to keep in mind in all sure. of this. You have 75,000 young people. Mm. Of that 75,000, you have a cohort of young people that are 14 to 16. Right. Overwhelmingly, you want to focus these types of efforts in two directions. Can your 14 or 16 equip themselves to do distance work on a classroom basis? And can you generate sufficient employment opportunities and or placements for your 16 to 21? Okay, so two groups, okay. It's really one whole cohort of 75,000 young people, but right. the programming for the younger students is distinct okay. and different okay see the the younger the younger participants for a mess yep do not participate in workplace mm -hmm. they okay. participate in workplace learning mm -hmm. the the older students the 16 to 18 the 16 to 21 24 actually have placements you know in places mm -hmm. across of a variety of industries, hospitals, government, nonprofits, retail, retail businesses. In some cases, I mean, we've had placements at Google. We've had placements in a slew of places across the city. But that industry assessment is going to be key because I'm not sure if anybody is willing to accept students coming in mm -hmm. under the conditions that are being, you know, discussed and not not decided upon yet and um so the, uh, the numbers the numbers really look differently when you begin to you know parcel out who who could potentially be qualified for a job placement versus who could participate in classroom-based you know workplace learning Um, Alan, for the letter, um, I wanted to know if I could help out whoever's writing it, and I was wondering. Uh, what I would do is, is, you know, take a look at the report that I that I directed you to. Mm -hmm. All right, it is um, it's the most recent assessment. It might even have industry information from past placements there, mm -hmm. but it's on the DYCD website, and you would find it under publications and reports. Thank you. You're more than welcome. And, and I'm sorry, Alice, what, what is that report? The title? It's, the, uh, it's titled Summer Youth Employment. Summer Youth. An assessment of summer youth employment. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Um, 
Okay, so we, we, we have a couple of members from the public uh, on the call. Does anybody? I don't see any hands raised, but no, no. I just had one more thing on the summer. Are we finished talking about summer school? I just had one more question for Carl, more of a statement actually. I know that the uh, JCC, there are several nonprofits that would like to offer tutoring. Um, uh, and but the, there's some sort of legal issue with the DOE that like a licensed teacher has to be in the room. Yeah. And yes. so I'm wondering maybe, is there someone that the JCC can speak to at your office to try to figure out a way to get around this? They actually run a summer school program every year and they've done it for I think over a decade. But now that it's potentially moving to online that creates all kinds of other issues because there are no licensed teachers there, there's no security, there, there are no DOE people there. So that was part of the problem with offering tutoring to students. Unless it, the, that, the DOE didn't really want to get involved unless they were actually teachers doing it. Um, so, I mean, I mean, we have a education policy staff that I'm sure we could arrange uh, a phone, uh, some sort of phone call if, um, if, you know, folks are interested in having that conversation. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, so a couple letters. We have a vote. Anybody opposed to um, the letters going to the mayor's office, the state, the congressional people? Does anybody second the motion? Second. Perfect. Let's get clarity on this just so I'm writing in the minutes right now. Okay. This is a letter on the summer youth employment, is that yes. correct? Correct. Got it. Okay. Um, I, I have I to. Oh, sorry, I, I have to go to another meeting, but I, I want to thank you all for uh, for all. Thank of you, you, Carl. Thank, okay. you. thank you, Carl. All right. Talk soon, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Be safe, Carl. Thank you. Bye, Carl. Alan and Inga, did you hear me about wanting to help out with the letter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I heard you. We heard you loud and clear, babe. Okay, good. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move on to the to the next. Um, uh, um, agenda. Uh, the first, the first item was was canceled at the one DOT with the news rack. So I'll just uh, see if Blake, if you have any update or you want to say a few words about it. We have to vote on the letter. We have to I'm vote sorry, on I'm sorry. First. I, don't to, I don't mean to say anything. So I, I, everybody in favor, raise yeah, your you. hand for the I letter. We voted. Oh, okay. Everyone in favor except we've got Jacqueline. Well, she's not a board member, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> all right, so all in favor? Perfect. Wait, I, anybody opposed? Anybody opposed? You're Ms. muted. Judith. You are opposed. Judith is opposed. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Perfect. We will be right I just wanted to say that I'm really opposed to this because I think kids from that age are really not set up for an environment that's ready for the pandemic. And I was just late coming to this meeting for a, a town hall with Gerald Nadler, and he is also talking about who knows what schools are going to look like in September. So putting kids in, in job training, in work sites over the summer, it's not, I don't think it's good. And I'm really opposed to the letter. Okay. Employment for the youth can be virtual. It doesn't have to be well, a I, I location. You know, I've seen, I don't know what you think virtual learning is going to be like, but I'm a teacher and I'm doing every single day virtual learning and it's not easy. It's difficult. It is. It's nothing like being in the school. And um, Diane Ravitch just wrote a big letter about that. The, the love affair with distance learning is over because it's nothing like being in school. I mean, my son's are graduating from college, my daughter is a junior, so, and I'm a teacher. So I think this distant learning thing is really not going to be the right place for us to think of as education, as leaders in education, so. Alan, can you clarify what the letter is, please? That we're, that the, we're the, letter, the letter is regarding the summer program, not anything going past. Youth employment. Uh, yeah, trying to encourage, well, I don't think putting kids in youth employment, even if it's just learning, is going to be a good thing because it's, it's, it's not a good situation. And what is real learning going to be like sitting on okay. a computer? But Judith, what is the alternative? There's, Judith, there, there's, two, there's two sections to this. Right. There's employment, and then there's a learning situation. And in either case, not 
all the kids are going to be able to be involved with it, depending on what their capacity is, and what, what their situation is, and what the money is. Well, the only thing we're doing here is we're encouraging our representatives to find the money and the agencies to do the best they can to try to get these kids on the programs that they were ordinarily would be on regardless of what was happening on the outside. What happens in September, that's, you know, that's, that's a total of the year at this point. Okay, so um, let's move on. Inga has an exciting program she wants to talk about. Thank you, yes. Um, I have been, I, I, I'll start it off with, I know all of you heard about this, the woman emergency room doctor that killed herself like two weekends ago, I think. I can't remember when. Um, she committed suicide. Everyone heard about it. It really just hit home, bothered me a lot. And I just tried to figure out how to help these doctors and emergency workers who are seeing things that they normally wouldn't see unless they were soldiers in a war. And then I thought of the old fashioned letter writing to soldiers. Um, kids in school would write letters to soldiers. The soldiers would carry them around. It was sort of a personal thing. It was like their connection to being back in the United States, if you want to say. Um, so I talked to some different people I know, and I reached out to, thanks to Jesse, reminded me to reach, I think it was, no, it wasn't Jesse. Um, Jesse has reached out to Mount Sinai West, where we have our board meetings. Um, and he's waiting to hear back to see if someone there will receive letters. Um, Wayne, um, a person that works at um, Northwell Hospital in Greenwich Village, who I know has was very enthusiastic and said it would really help the emergency workers, the nurses, the doctors, and everyone else there if he would get letters from students or adults and he would post them in their lounges and in different areas because it brings a little more humanity back to it. They're, they're just seeing dead people basically or people that are near death. Um, so they're already on board. Um, I have another person that works at Presbyterian downtown um, and she's in the pharmacy area, but she's reached out to someone in the, in the doctor's nursing area. They're willing to take letters. I've talked to the Avenue School and they've already included it in their curriculum. So it's gonna be part of their, the teachers are going to actually help the students write letters as part of their curriculum. Writing is good. The kids are gonna have a project. They can draw pictures. They can write a thank you letter to emergency staff. So the Avenue School is already working on it. So it's gonna be school-wide with their K through five. And now they're working on, I think the middle school section of kids. Um, and so we're gonna start sending letters to these emergency, to these hospitals. Um, so I was trying to get it out there and try to get more people and hopefully, I don't know if our public schools included that in their curriculum, little kids would love doing that. Their parents would like being involved. I think it's a kind of a connection. Um, so yes, I'm very passionate about this. So I'm bringing it everywhere and I've gotten a lot of people involved, but I think we can do more at the community board level. I think if we could get the education department to kind of get that into their curriculum, schools and teachers would help the kids make cards and send them to hospitals for EMTs, doctors, nurses, the people that clean up. I mean, it's just sad that they're living in such a sad situation. So I could go on, I get very moved by this. So I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would just suggest as a hospital uh, mm -hmm. that's, that serves the whole city, that just uh, where, where it's located is, would be Bellevue. I need a contact. Uh, I need I'll, get you, I'll, get you, I'll get you a contact for emergency room, pediatrics room, all of that stuff. Yeah, I, that would be great. Um, but I mean, do. is there a way we can get it into the schools, get the teachers, to get our schools to start mm -hmm. doing it with the mm -hmm. students? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an easy thing for teachers to do online parents wouldn't mind doing it. And I think it would help the students, the parents, they feel like they're doing something and the people that receive the letters. And, and, and it should be something that hopefully if the kids are back in the brick and mortar situation that they continue that um, yeah. 
after September, just to, to keep that contact going. I think it would be a good thing, so. Okay. All right, cool. Good. Inga, mm -hmm. our RPS, had, uh, their art department has done hundreds of paintings that the kids have made, have sent to area hospitals. I'll try to find the contact number. So that's PS333, but in terms of writing, which mm -hmm. is, I think, is a tremendous idea. And I would like to work with you trying to get that information to my school at least or to talk with you further about this but writing great. assignments are really tough and to make it personal and emotional in the next few weeks i think would be a great idea okay good. Uh, inga also i think my, my daughter actually had that uh assignment um and she's in first grade the teacher they did it um that they're superheroes the frontline workers are superheroes and to write a letter that they were like a superhero and draw a picture of them as superheroes. And the, kid, my, the kids loved it. And they drew them as superheroes and then uh, it was sent on and I heard it was very, very well received. Okay. So um, kudos to you, I think it's a great idea. I know my daughter loved it and I'm sure the others will too. Yeah. If we can yeah, get it in there. Today. Avenues jumped right on and just jumped on the idea. So I'm very happy with Avenues School. So Inka, we did the same thing with the high school of fashion industries. We did fashion designs for all the students that we sent it to the UFT, which sent it to all the different people. So that's a good, that's a wonderful initiative. Yeah. I think the I think the letters are uh, you know personal. I just remember as a kid the soldier letters. So, and we liked writing them when we were kids. So okay. all right. So all right. That's my idea. I just wanted to bring that up and maybe people can take it farther. Okay, so we'll put a little committee together and you'll still be here to... to... Oh, definitely. And I've got London Terrace working on it. You know, I'm working, still working with the Avenue schools and I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'll keep pushing. Right. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I uh, was going to over to Blake, just if, if, a recap before we go over to, uh, to the budget area, unless there's anything else anybody wants to comment on on this um, this project, but uh, if not, Blake, any, any updates on this? Kit has, Kit. Kit has a question. Oh, Kit uh, has a question, sorry. Because we're on Zoom, I was able to sort of multitask and just try to look at the New York State uh, standards and writing at different uh, age groups. We'd be happy to help out with the project and maybe pitch mm -hmm. in what could this look like at different grade levels to hopefully mm -hmm. get more teachers um, involved. In okay, so I, I would, then I would suggest that uh, you guys contact Anga and you can set up, you can set up a Zoom meeting or something, you know, crazy like that, you know, for the... Yeah. <laughs> Or just run with it. I mean, whatever we can get letter writing to them. I think the staff really, it's its just so personal. And I think kids kids would like it too. And they'd feel good about it. So yeah, there's a kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Hi. <laughs> oh, big girl. Oh, boy. Okay, Blake. What's yeah. happening there on the news rack field? Yeah, on the news rack front. Well, we phoned the primary discussion around this for this committee to uh, the next meeting. Um, Janine is helping us to coordinate a working group meeting with uh, DOT as well as some um, representatives from trans. And so we sent over some questions that we were interested in, primarily around rates of enforcement of the current uh, news rack regulations, which DOT is responsible for as well as some other questions that might help with, um, you know, approaching uh, other news rack providers. Uh, you know, for example, if DOT is interested or willing to pick a news rack design that's, um, you know, sort of standard for different publishers. So, you know, I think uh, we'll be able to get some additional color on their current practices around enforcing the uh, current regulations, which are pretty robust, as well as their thoughts on strengthening some of the areas that have been deficient, you know, particularly uh, people toppling over in the news racks, being too close to the link NYC terminals, um, you know, non-compliance um, and then non-maintenance um, without much enforcement of some news racks in, in various locations. So we'll be able to bring that back. Um, Wendy and Sabrina are also gonna be a part of that along with David, uh, who will be a trans uh, representative um, uh, and a couple of other trans members um, as part of that group. Cool. Thank Look you, Blake. Don't drop this. Keep going with it. <laughs> yeah, we'll get those news racks. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess we're ready to move on to this budget thing. I tell you, it's crazy, right? Crazy. I was I was trying to read 
the May's budget thing that was in the package? I don't know. It's over my head. <laughs> so I'll, I'll turn it over to, to the committee members who are more into um, education and funding and where the money goes, perhaps, if they know where it goes. I have a couple of comments, but I, I'd like to hear from you guys and from anybody else who's um, uh, looked into this. So we'll start with anger. Thank you. I just want to say one thing at the beginning, please. I know that I'm stepping down as chair. Don't let the arts go. I no, know no, 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 no. David, 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 David is taking over the arts thing. It's becoming yeah, step up a little. Yeah, step up a little bit, David. So, Count them. <laughs> David, Blake, the other one, people on the committee. I know education is important, but arts and street life very important. Very important. Don't drop it. Don't don't just focus on. I know education is important, but okay. Well, arts in it, arts in education. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay. Which I think is part of the budget in here somewhere, right? I think hey, I uh, Inga, I, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I appreciate that, Inga. And Jesse, I was actually going to tell you, uh, uh, the League of Independent Theater is going to stage their own town hall on the loss of basically the independent theater community, which I'm been a big advocate for a long time is going away. It's gone. It's it's a huge epic sea change in the cultural life of New York City. And so there's a town hall. I offered to have them to have us work with them in the promotion and the marketing of it and perhaps to run it, but they decided they wanted to do it themselves um, with an association with some other companies. Perhaps we can um, get the word out, and I want to maybe talk to you, Jesse, about getting some uh, some political people involved. You know, but it's at the end of May. I'll send some more information to you and to the committee. But it's a yeah, huge yeah, issue, and it's say. kind of it's yeah. shocking actually that one. That's the same. You froze up there. He said got bandwidth issues. But David, can you keep me personally on that? Good. Yes, Inga. Good. Well, hey, Jesse. Go ahead, yeah, Jesse. You sent me the same, the same date information, um, you know, and whatever the how to sign in or log in or whatever okay. it is, we can definitely blast it out. And obviously, if you want me to connect you to with, you know, any of the electeds, that's that's fine. That's right. Fine. Thanks, Jess. Okay. So, so I guess we're gathered here to to look at this budget and see what we want to keep, what we want to like let go of, or I mean, what is it, you know, what, what are our priorities to keep? Um, I mean, every, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the shorter version of this, uh, the synopsis of this. I mean, most of this stuff is like, you know, six million, four million. I mean, I, I know it all adds up and in the context of the whole budget, it adds up to a lot of money. Um, but then you look at um, operational savings and training, overtime materials at schools, a hundred million. Uh, so I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. They say due to school building closures, does that mean that they saved this money already? Jesse? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh -huh. It says operational savings and training, overtime, materials at schools, central and field due to school building closures, DOE, 100 million in FY20. So well, yeah, so then, yeah, that would be right. That would be, if it's an FY20, then that's what they're talking about, what they're, what they're you know. So they saved that money already. Well, they're currently saving In it, the yeah. process. They're currently saving. So that money should have come, gone to education. So if they're saving that money, that money theoretically is in an account somewhere. Well, I'm just trying to be simple about it because that's what I am, I think. So the money somewhere, they didn't spend it, right? So if they didn't spend it for this, then they can spend it somewhere else in education. Or that money's gonna go maybe for NYPD or for sanitation. I mean, is that how this whole thing is? Is like you know playing out. My my super rudimentary reading of it was that exactly like this is what their holistic savings were, mm -hmm. but they obviously have huge deficits in other areas. So funding okay. hospitals, 
for example. Mm -hmm. right? So it's in the account, but the account is already overdrawn because those other expenses were so expensive. And their, their income from property taxes and other things like that are going to be dramatically reduced just because mm -hmm. people are not going to be able to pay them. And, and I think there are going to be other new school expenses that aren't even on there. I mean, if you're going to take the temperature of all the kids, they need to install those things that you walk in and you, those are very expensive. I mean, you can't have someone with a thermometer doing every kid. You have to do the scanner temperature. That's if they're going to install things like that in the schools, that's going to be a huge technology expense. Yeah. I don't, I don't see that happening. I just don't even know how are they going to take people's te kids temperatures unless they have those, you know, you walk through the scanner and it reads your temperature. And, and not only that is the big cleaning expenses. I mean, I've been emailing the UFT representatives, representatives about that. Who's going to do all the cleaning? They think they're going to hire all these custodians. I mean, where's that budget going to come from? It's just crazy. Right. right. Kids had to leave unexpectedly. So a lot of the young students didn't even empty their lockers or cubbies and things like that. I suppose one school up here I'm helping with just volunteering and we thought we devised actually a plan and the school's actually implementing it um, that the bus drivers are going to we had custodians come in bag up the kids clothes put the label on it so each bus route is going to have you know 20 bags of kids bags and the bus drivers are going to drop them all off at their stops I mean, that's just upstate, but how are these kids even going to get their stuff in New York? I don't know. Because they the have to clean things out. The school that you're volunteering with, Inga, is that a private school? No, it's a public school up here. Yeah, uh, where are they going to get the money for the custodians and cleaning the schools? I mean, that's you a have whole to get the kids stuff back to them. So there are so many unexpected expenses. I think that any money that is there is just gone. So what's our story here? You just I mean, have to pick some priorities. I mean, you know. I think what are some of the education priorities? What are your top three priorities? I mean, you've got a whole list of stuff. I mean, you have, you have, you have arts that's going to, that, that is um, looking to be cut. That's uh, $40 million in going into FY21. Mm -hmm. yeah, but before we look at the arts, we have to look at safety. And that means, like Inga was saying, about the scanning of the students, the cleaning of the schools, putting the kids back. I mean, it's just... Uh, um, well, we don't, for, we don't know what that is. We don't know if they're going to do it that way. No, and we don't. That's going to be somebody else who's going to determine if they're going to hold the thing in front of their foreheads or they're going to invest the money in that. Scanners. But I, think, I think what we have here is a list on the education... Um, we need to pick what our priorities are. We'll see what our priorities are going to be, but um, I don't know. I don't know. May I, may I suggest that this yeah. might be um, a conversation first, maybe for the education committee, just to break it. It's just such a big nut. I don't know, yeah. Jesse. What do what are you? I don't know. Well, what I, I think what we're asking each of the committees to do is to. Um, come to some level of consensus about what are the concerns about the cuts, right? And so if there's a particular item, whether, you know, I can, you can say, if you wanted to say like education is just the most important. So, you know, as you know, all the things that your committee has a sphere of influence over, there needs to be, I think Judith's point is to saying whether they do it in one way or another, but safety is obviously the priority. Unfortunately, the programming might need to take a, a, a back, a, a, you know, a, um, a back burner to, 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 to safety. And, the, and so the budget needs to really be prioritized around that. that, that your idea, Leslie, is fine. I mean, I think you can, guys can do it a couple different ways. I mean, listen, uh, you know, I don't know how long you guys want to go tonight about discussing this. Um, I think maybe if everybody wants to take a look at it and if there, someone wants to sort of be the point person from the committee to, to accept all of the information, mm -hmm. um, you know, and sort of summarize it and be able to then send it to the budget task force, which Leslie is on. So maybe, maybe it's Leslie if, <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, Thanks, Jesse. So there can be some, some ideas around that. You know, I mean, there are public safety issues, obviously, that, that sort of fall into the 
the street life component mm -hmm. of all of, you know, of the committee. I mean, there's obviously going to be cuts to things like arts and, you know, funding for the arts and all of that. And so, you know, I, I you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's unique that we're, like what Alan said is that you guys really are being asked to look at what's being proposed to be cut and sort of pick out one or two priority can't things. Live without. I don't think this should be cut. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, you know, um, at, you know, and so really advocating for those things for that one or two things. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think how you do it, uh, so my, my other question was, okay, so you want to take, I don't know, let's say uh, $10 million out of putting in air conditioners. Again, you know, do we keep that $10 million in 21 in the education budget, forget the air conditioners and fund ABC, right? I think you're going to get, I mean, like $10 million in the city's budget is is a drop in the bucket. Drop in the bucket. So right, I'm but, but that Angela is going to mm -hmm. is going to take. You guys will it'll be very complicated. I think you're looking for broad strokes here, in my opinion. Right, right. No, what we're saying, can we shift the money around? I mean, can we? You know, okay. I you think know, you can make that as a recommendation. I think. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. The whatever revenue savings that came from FY20 should be focused to priority A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know when. So, Jesse, we're going macro, um, not micro. Committee, but I'm wondering if it's worth um, having a conversation with the principals first before we make these decisions, at least but, in terms of the schools. That's a lot of schools. It's a lot yeah, of. But are we going macro or micro, Jesse? If we're yeah. going macro, then no. are we going macro or micro? I, I think you should, in my opinion, you should go macro. Macro. Right? Yeah. Macro. We're not getting into. Like right. I said, I which school? Right, right. The, the right. committee is the, the budget task force is, push, is the budget task force is pushing this or turning this around in like thirty okay, days. Oh yeah, okay. no, I I didn't mean um talking to you know looking out for each individual school, just getting an overall general idea. So I, I that's what maybe we can try. What we can try to do is do a quick survey. Um if someone wants to sort of maybe if someone from this education subgroup would like to kind of i guess what the word would be to like prioritize like sort of put together like the three major cuts components and ask the principals which of the three major cut components is the most important to for us to advocate for whether it be you know and i'm uh, josephine and leslie and kit and uh, and judith know better than myself and david i mean better than me but you know trying to come up with that kind of survey so there we can shoot that out qu quickly see whatever responses we get back we get you know 10 responses they all say you know number one issue is um is uh, safety or number one issue is putting all the money towards better distance learning because we all know i was gonna, gonna say that learning. yeah the flip side yeah, what if they say we need distance learning? yeah yeah mm -hmm. all right so we could definitely do that josephine i just think it, it, it'll be have, it'll, it won't be perfect and it'll right. but I, I will for for it to happen i think i would need your guys' assistance to draft kind of like the the summary i mean the the survey you know, at least the questions we can design the survey. We'll just use forms or, or uh, you know, Google Forms or, or uh, 365, and we can do that easily. I just need the the, the questions crafted. I'm uh, very happy like, to uh, work on that. I like the idea, Josephine and Jesse, and I wonder if, in addition to asking the principals, we give them the option of sending a, a survey to their teachers, um, so we could also get their input as well. And whatever responses we get, we get. Um, right. But I think. This is one of those situations where the more data points we can use to inform our decision making, the better. Um, and in line with what uh, Leslie said a bit of, one item on here that really jumps out at me is the professional development reduction. Um, I think we've heard from numerous folks uh, tonight, and I think we all know that the experience that kids are getting, uh, the main variable right now is who is your teacher? Um, because within a school building, across the city's networks of schools, um, how distance learning is being implemented is not standardized. Yeah. Um, and teachers have not been given the training um, to you know, make the switch from 
teaching in the building to uh, teaching while kids yeah. are learning at home. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we are going to um, put them in a position where they can be substantially more successful, which is what I think um, we all want to help them be if they're not getting trained on how to approach learning at home. Uh, so that's one item on here that I really think we uh, might want to say is our, our hill to die on, but that's just one person's opinion. Okay. Judith, uh, do you want to say something? Judith has been raising her hand for a while. Yes, I just wanted to add that um, thank you for uh, recognizing the strength of our principals in our district and in all over the city, but it's not really their decision. It's the superintendents and the chancellors. And then whatever rules come down, then the principals have to implement them. So when we send out the survey, it shouldn't really be the principal. It should be the chancellor, the state uh, education person, and the the representatives who make those decisions that come down and funnel it to the principals that that make our schools safe. So when we're when we're looking at it, you know, we're, it's nice to include the principals and the teachers, but those are not the decision makers. Those are the the worker bees. So I just want to make sure that that's clear, because mm -hmm. when we're making the survey, it should be with the decision makers who are making those decisions and and thinking about that. I mean, I like what Tip said about those that I imagine school. I mean listening to what they have to say might be an interesting way of, of experiencing what's you know, going to be changing in our education world. But there's gonna be some really big changes and the small class size. So if we have six feet uh, distance between the students, the 32 class size of students who are normally going to happen are not gonna happen because there's only gonna be 16 people in a classroom. I mean, how is that gonna change education? So all the things that we're looking at has to come from like up there. The chancellor, the superintendents, all those people. Yeah, good point, good point. So let, let me ask you something else, Jesse. Since we're concentrating here on education, but we do have a street life committee and we overlap somewhat, all right? Street life and arts and culture, which overlaps with some other committees. I would suggest that the street life committee look at these other portions of this budget cutback and perhaps do the same thing somehow and submit that also uh, to the uh, budget task force. Pick out something you can't live without. We got to, you know. Yeah, I can look at our uh, recommendations in the budget process where we advocated for some of these same issues and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of reiterate what mm -hmm. we had uh, done in support of these issues before and, you know, why they should not necessarily be cut in this process. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I think uh, something coming out of the, the Street Life Committee in terms of what they would like to see that affects street life, whether it's trans, whether it's the garbage, whether it's NYPD, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, the other committees that are more focused on this and have had, you know, their hands on this for a long time will, will have their own um, uh, input to this. But, you know, you guys may come up with an idea where they say, hey, you know, that's a good idea. So I think, I think that same survey that the education people are going to do should be also part of what we what we offer. Mm -hmm. So, so, real quickly, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Superintendent, yeah, but I just yeah. want to say real quick. So, we can try to do the same thing if Blake would, Blake and other members of the Street Life Committee want to kind of review what the cuts are going to be, sort of prioritize them in a way, sort of ask some sort of you know, I wouldn't, I don't think we want to do more than three or four questions kind of survey. We can shoot mm -hmm. that to the block associations heads if we want to see what we get back and 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 say that that would be what we are saying I, mm -hmm. I, in terms of just process I just want to be you know a, a fair is that saying like if we're doing that now then what we're saying is whatever the surveys come back and then what the responses are that is going to sort of dictate what the committee is saying is the is the is their consensus is what should mm -hmm. be the answer so I think yeah, yeah. You understand? So we're not we're we're sort of taking ourselves a little bit out of the uh, <laughs> out of the out of the leadership role in that position, and that's fine. I just want us to be we're not we can't start making committee decisions after the fact, whatever we're deciding right. on tonight. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So what's the plan? The plan is. Sabrina has her hand up. Yeah, Sabrina. Sabrina had a question. Hi, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just concerned, and I'm just curious if we can, in Street of Life Committee, uh, we can add safety. Um, would that be something that maybe we can circle back? I don't, I haven't really looked into it, but um, 
but you know the the, the safety and then the restriction of like what's going to be like and are we really I, I don't know if we can have a, any question of this and i don't know what is in the budget but in terms of like uh, are we going to give any some sort of fee uh, to folks who are not wearing masks is that would be falling into us outside or parks um, I don't know. I'm just curious. Maybe we can frame something on that guide, or, or that's just just too high to, to think in in those questions of of the street life. Hmm. Well, I was thinking that something that would be helpful is also a list of what are the priorities for funding. You know, because right now we have a list of all of the things that we're going to be cut in order to get to the number that needs to, you know have a balanced budget but you know some areas like what sabrina was talking about where you know sanitation takes on a new meaning uh in this situation and you know there's gonna have to be additional funding for priorities like that mm -hmm. as well as i think you know some other areas that were potential for cuts but why they were not cut in this budget because right now it's very hard to say you know no we should not have this cut if something else that you know is also critical for us is going to be cut otherwise but i'm not sure if the mayor's office had prepared that as part of the um you know their budget process well i think well the only thing we do is we're just proposing what we want for our community basically mm -hmm. the administration is going to do what they have to do hopefully based on what comes in not just from our community board but there's five other community boards in manhattan and there's X number of community boards, Queens, Bronx, and Brooklyn, and what's that other borough? Oh, Staten Island. <laughs> Wait, so anyway, so, but, you know, all, all we can do is put our, ourselves out there. This is what we would like. And the budget committee will put it all together. And hopefully, if they see something that is um, uh, a good idea, and maybe, you know, it didn't come out of the committee that would normally handle that. They'll say, you know, that's a good idea. Let's put it in there and and and, and go with it and make and make that um, suggestion and see what happens. You know, I guess it all comes down to the bucks at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify, because David asked the question of when we have to get this in uh, through the chat, um, the committee's this budget task force meeting is on the twenty sixth. Uh, so I think if we can get uh, oh, May can get or through, June, May, May. May. Um, if we can get our answers in by minimum by the 22nd, the Friday the, before the you know, the holiday, um, that would be helpful. So I mean, if if uh, Josephine and Kit and mm -hmm. Leslie maybe want to work on the survey to the principals and be able to then do the turnaround and get the answers back and kind of put them together in a way that makes sense. Um, and then if uh, Blake and uh, Sabrina and whoever else is on the street life committee want to um, work on that, uh, however, in which way you want to do it. Um, and with the idea that basically getting sort of, you know, kind of a, a pulling everything together in a, in a, in a document by the, mm -hmm. by the 22nd, you know, yeah, just so we have a couple priorities, some strong priorities, whether or not they happen or not. Mm. This year's up in the air. Okay, we need to vote on this. <laughs> just need, uh, I yeah, we I mean, vote, you're, to, you're not voting on this. Yeah, I think we should at least agree that the subcommittee. We'll agree. Let's agree to agree. It. Yeah, I think the subcommittee should be able to prioritize for mm -hmm. us. So on our behalf. Uh, does everybody have everybody else's emails or you want us to send send it all out to everybody we'll send it all out I would send it out again so everybody has a fresh list okay yeah cool hey all right any other comments Ing it's been a pleasure it has been a pleasure I will see you pleasure. often and uh stay in touch thank you very much for everything that you've done for us We'll get Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. You too. I'll be Thanks, back. Sandra. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> See you soon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Everybody stay well. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The letter, the employment letter. Employment letter? Uh, the summer youth employment. Is Maria, are you going to do that?
Well, oh, Alan and I Je will Jesse, talk about Jesse's going to send us the letter that you have. We're right? going to get copies yeah. of the letter. Okay. We'll, we'll send it out and then we'll. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, no, I said I would help. I would help. Okay. So, we'll help. Doing it. It's <laughs> to get the Kit, copy Kit, from Kit, will, Kit, will, Kit will write. Maria will help. Josephine will uh, edit. <laughs> How's that? Fine with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Jesse will send us Thank a you, everybody. Good night, guys. Bye. Bye. Stay safe.